In this section, we'll cover the architectural implications of creating a safe autonomous vehicle. A significant challenge for deploying machine learning-based systems is that their behavior can be very complicated and validation of the exact behavior may be infeasible. A classic approach to dealing with this is to use the concept of a safety envelope. In this picture, we've represented the safe part of the state space of the behavior of the system with green and the unsafe part that lies outside the safe boundaries with red with this representing a multi-dimensional space rather than just two dimensions shown for illustration. If you want to validate or build a checking system that polices this boundary, that checking will be very complicated as the boundary gets complicated. The idea of a safety envelope is to first police the boundary, but second, come up with a practical way of simplifying the boundary so that the architectural component policing the boundary can be simpler than the thing attempting optimized behavior. To do this, a typical safety envelope simplifies the specification of what is safe, here notionally represented as going from a very complicated boundary to a circle. In practice, it may not literally be a circle, but the idea is that there's some simple to check boundary that is of low complexity compared to the actual boundary. This simplified safety envelope is intended to provide a simple, highly reliable way to see whether the system is safe or unsafe. A monitor is created to check whether or not the system is currently within the known safe boundary, the green, and when the boundary has been crossed, implement a safety shutdown to make sure the system remains safe. There's an inherent tension here in that the simpler the safety envelope is made, the easier it is to build a checker but the more complicated behavior can be ruled out, even though in theory it would be unsafe, but the checker is not complicated enough to appreciate that. In practice, this pattern can still be useful because many times the complexity of the system operating in the safe space is not oriented toward safety, but rather toward optimizing other parameters such as fuel economy, ride comfort, and things of this nature. So while the use of a safety envelope reduces the permissiveness in other words, the ability of the underlying control system to exercise the complete area of the safe state space. It does make it much more feasible and much more simpler to ensure safety is maintained, even if the system cannot be proven to be safe for all conditions. A common architectural pattern for implementing a safety envelope is to use a doer checker pair. In a doer checker pair, there's a doer subsystem which implements the normal, potentially untrusted functionality. In a machine learning based system, the idea would be that the machine learning part goes in the doer. It may be somewhat trusted via validation, but not validated to have life critical levels of dependability. That's where the checker comes in. The checker is a traditional software not based on machine learning that can be designed to a suitably high SIL. It does not duplicate the function of the doer, but rather implements the safety envelope boundary and detects when the doer's behavior has left from the safe state space to the unsafe state space and can trigger a safety shutdown or other relevant safety action. In this pattern, the checker is entirely responsible for safety. The idea is that the doer does whatever it does and optimizes whatever it optimizes so long as it does not cross the safety envelope boundary. The checker's job is not to duplicate the doer's functionality, but simply to police the safety envelope boundary and detect when it's been crossed. This means the doer can be at a low safety integrity level, while the checker can be entirely responsible for safety operating at a high safety integrity level. This classic pattern has also been known as a safety bag approach or a monitor actuator pair. They're all basically the same idea of having a high sill checker policing the behavior of a low sill doer. A simplistic approach to implementing safety envelopes is to have the checker part of a doer checker pair slam on the brakes with maximum force as soon as the safety envelope has been exited. For a vehicle, the safety envelope might be, for example, a fixed distance to an obstacle that will be hit, with a vehicle jamming on the brakes anytime it sees anything too close. While in practical applications, systems may be a bit more complex, 
this is not so far away from how some low-speed shuttles might operate. However, if you're carrying passengers, simply slamming on the brakes might not be enough, especially if there are false activations in which sensors falsely detect objects that aren't really there. In 2020, a shuttle was taken out of service because of a false alarm stop that resulted in a passenger who was not belted in being thrown around and suffering a facial injury. A couple months later, that company was allowed to resume operations, but was required to use seatbelts. It's unclear why seatbelts were not installed in the first place, but they went back into operation with seatbelts. However, once back in operation, there was another crash, this time with a chase car crashing into the back of the shuttle. There are a couple lessons from this sequence of events. The first is that it's important to coordinate passenger safety with vehicle motion safety. If a vehicle motion safety plan requires aggressive braking, then it's important to know that the passengers will be safely secured so they're not injured during a braking event. The second one is that maximum braking might not be the safest approach, especially if you plan on having a chase car tailgating the vehicle that can then run into it. At higher speeds, simply jamming on the brakes when there's an object too close may not be sufficient to be able to ensure safety or might require operational procedures that are too conservative to be practical, especially at high speeds on heavily traveled roads. Once more permissive operational capabilities are required, the safety envelope needs to be a bit more complicated and instead of simply having a proximity generated panic braking maneuver, a more detailed analysis of the physics involved is required. The Responsibility Sensitive Safety, RSS, approach uses physics-based analysis to determine what safe following distances are and other geometric considerations to analyze what maneuvers are safe, what maneuvers are not safe, and what a proper response should be in various geometric situations. While a variety of different geometric situations are considered, the simplest one is a leader-follower scenario. A following car wants to leave enough distance so that it cannot possibly crash into a leading car. It does this by considering how fast the lead car can brake, how fast the following car can brake, and the response time for the following car to begin braking. Some Newtonian mechanics calculations that end up being a little more complicated than you might think create a solution in which the following car can always know the minimum safe following distance to avoid any possible collision with the car in front of it. If the following car is closer, it should reduce speed to give more following distance. And if it's farther away, then it's permitted to close the gap a little if it desires to do so. While the math can guarantee no possible collision, there are some practical considerations to be taken into account. The first is that the proofs assume you have an absolutely perfect model of the world. That means you need precise knowledge about the environment, such as the road surface friction along the entire stopping distance, the other vehicle capabilities, such as how good its brakes are, and own vehicle capabilities, such as whether your brakes are at maximum effectiveness or they've recently become wet or overheated. In practice, it's almost impossible to have precise knowledge, so approximations and safety margins need to be added. The other issue is that in real traffic, you may often be in a situation in which it is not possible to be mathematically safe. For example, in a heavily packed rush hour, you may be operating with a maximum distance away from all the vehicles around you, but the Newtonian mechanics says it's possible you'll still hit something despite your best efforts. Nonetheless, doing a physics-based analysis of the vehicle behavior is an excellent starting point to make sure that your vehicle is behaving in a safe, reasonable way and gives you a basis for establishing safety envelopes to trigger varying degrees of response, such as slowly trying to increase distance or applying panic braking. While simulators and mathematical approaches can give the illusion of a guarantee of perfect safety, the big gap that will exist in practice is having a model of the external world. All the software on the vehicle assumes that it knows something about the external world, but if that knowledge is imperfect or incorrect, it will not produce perfectly safe outputs. A particular challenge is modeling the world not only where the vehicle is, but where the vehicle is going to be before it can complete a maneuver. 
Anyone in a northern climate has seen warning signs about the bridge may ice over before the roadway, and here's an example. The idea here is if you know the friction of the road surface, you can compute how fast you can stop. But if the friction changes dramatically before you get a chance to be fully stopped, you might be in for a surprise on how long it will take to stop. In this case, if you encounter the icy bridge before you're done with the stop, you're going to be sliding along the road a lot further than you expected before you actually reach a stop. Autonomous vehicles have different stages in a software control pipeline. Different techniques are suitable for use in each stage. At the vehicle control stage, this is traditional automotive software and traditional software validation techniques should work just fine. The trajectory execution stage is mostly traditional control systems and control software validation ought to do fine. Doer checker architectural approaches can be helpful but are not strictly required. The planning stage is a bit more difficult because it uses non-deterministic randomized and heuristic algorithms in some cases. Runtime safety envelopes can be very helpful here paired with a doer checker architecture. As an example, the doer could try and find an optimized path through known obstacles, while the checker mostly is concerned about whether that path hits anything rather than the optimality of the path selection. Perception systems typically use machine learning-based approaches. The difficulty there is that it's hard to know how to build a checker to see if the perception classification was correct. While a safety envelope approach may help a little bit, in general, there's no known deterministic algorithms that can be validated at a high integrity level to ensure the perception is working properly. For the perception part of things, typically you see lots of simulation and a safety of the intended function set if approach. A uniquely challenging aspect of this technology is that perception and predictions of future behaviors based on perception and other factors are uniquely difficult to validate and provide safety assurances for. Predicting the future behavior of objects is perhaps one of the most challenging and crucial parts of getting autonomous vehicles to be safe in practice. Simplistically, the idea is not so complicated. There's the idea of free space, this is space devoid of objects, and that defines the available drivable area. The idea is if you go where the free space is, you'll be safe. But there's a catch. For all but the slowest vehicles operating in the most benign environments, Knowing where the free space is right now isn't good enough. You need to know where the free space is going to be when the vehicle gets there. And the more congested and chaotic the environment and the faster the vehicle is going, the more difficult that is to predict where the free space is going to be. Prediction often does not show up explicitly on an autonomy pipeline. There's planning and there's perception, but planning and perception interact when you need to decide what type of object you're looking at and what its likely future behavior is. While some systems simply do extrapolation of current path, you say, well, there's a car and it's going 30 miles an hour in a particular direction, probably it's going to keep going at about that speed and about that same direction. In fact, cars can turn quickly, but people are even more challenging. Here's a picture of a person on a street corner right next to a crossing walk. In this case, the classification system failed to classify it as a person, probably distracted by the garbage can, the light pole, and the sharp vertical lines of the scaffold behind. A human driver, which was me in this case, would look at that person and say, well, that person's probably not going to go anywhere. Looks like the person is looking for something behind me, possibly a bus, hands in pocket, relaxed posture, does not look like he's about to jump into the roadway. However, knowing whether or not I should panic brake for a pedestrian at a crosswalk requires some fairly sophisticated fine-grained classification. Not only do I have to recognize that it's a person and not part of the trash bin, I have to interpret the intent of the person from body language, facial expression, posture, and context. Something to keep in mind when arguing that there are multiple sensors that will see objects is that not all the sensors will be able to do fine enough grain classification to say not only is this a person accurately, but whether or not this is a person who is about to cross the road or a person who is very likely to remain in place as I travel through an intersection. A significant architectural distinction between driver assistance and automated driving systems is how failures are handled. 
For driver assistance features, it's normally sufficient for those features to fail silent. What this means is that if the driver assistance feature cannot operate properly, it needs to detect that it has a problem and then shut down that feature so that the driver can continue to drive without the feature causing problems. In other words, it's sufficient for the computer to fail silent and not affect vehicle operation if there's a problem. When switching to a fully automated system, the computer controls the vehicle. There's no driver continuously in the loop overseeing vehicle operation. That means that a computer failure has to result in a system that can still maintain control, in other words, fail operational. There's a reason that aircraft have two engines. That's so that if one of the engines stops working, the other engine is sufficient to continue operation and land the aircraft. In aircraft, after you lose an engine, you do not continue your 12-hour flight across the Pacific Ocean. Rather, you find the nearest airport that's suitable and you land as soon as you can. The same thing can be expected of automated vehicles. If they have a major computer failure, they can be expected to move to some sort of degraded mode and not continue an extra long mission during which there's too high a probability of other computers failing. This even affects SAE Level 3 vehicles. If there's a computer failure that prompts a takeover request, the vehicle still has to remain under control while it waits for the driver to take over control, or lacking that, performing some sort of maneuver to reduce the risk. That means that if one computer dies, there needs to be another computer ready to take over. That requires potentially more redundancy than a conventional vehicle, and it requires different fault management. On automated vehicles, computers no longer just fail silent. They have to fail operational and keep working at least for a little while to do something to mitigate the failure rather than leaving the vehicle uncontrolled at highway speed. A significant difference between traditional automotive safety and autonomous vehicle safety is that not only does the system have to detect and react to faults, but it has to keep operating even after a fault has been detected. The issue is that simply slamming on the brakes at highway speeds is unlikely to result in a safe outcome if that's the only response available to an equipment failure. That means there needs to be redundancy in two different regards. The first part of redundancy is to detect that the main operational channel has had a fault so that you know there's something that you have to react to. The second piece of redundancy required is being able to maintain vehicle operation even though the primary channel has failed. There are many different architectural approaches that can be used for this, and the industry has not yet sorted out which architectural approach or approaches will be standardized. This architecture example is from the BMW Voluntary Safety Self-Assessment Report and is therefore public information. The architecture has three channels for control. The first is a main channel, which is in normal use. The second channel is a safe channel. The idea in general is that if the main channel has a problem, the safe channel can recover from whatever's going on and bring the vehicle to a safe state, for example, by pulling over to the side of the road. However, because the main and the safe channels are both on the same ECU, there's the possibility that both channels will fail due to an ECU failure. That means a second ECU for degraded operation is required. The idea here is to have a very simple, very unlikely to fail control system that can bring the car to a safe stop, but maybe not in the optimal location that you'd prefer. The important takeaway here is that there will be significant amounts of functional and hardware redundancy in these vehicles, and that making sure all the redundant channels don't fail at the same time is especially important. Given that life-critical systems need to have redundancy so that they can fail operational at least to some degree, the question is, how do you achieve that redundancy at an affordable cost? A common approach for fully automated vehicles is to attempt an ACIL B of D redundancy strategy, pictured here in a very abstract way. The idea is that two ACIL B computing units receive independent inputs and perform some functions, but together they are so unlikely to fail together that ACIL D credit can be taken. 
It's important to remember that ACILs are not assigned to computational devices, but rather are assigned to safety requirements. The claim being made with ACIL B of D is that the safety requirements are at ACIL D, but they are decomposed to two independent ACIL B sets of requirements, with each of those sets of ACIL B requirements being allocated to an independent computational channel. The ACIL B of D decomposition strategy requires completely independent failures between the channels. This means that significant safety engineering effort needs to be spent on making sure that any potential common cause failures are identified and mitigated. Relevant common cause failure sources include using the same perception, sensor fusion, or planning algorithms on both channels. The reason for this is that if, for example, a sensor fusion algorithm has problems with one class of objects being identified or predicted correctly, that same flaw will show up on both channels if both channels use the same sensor fusion algorithm. Another common cause of failure is defects in the operating system, compiler, the libraries, and other support software shared between the two channels. Hardware design defects can also be an issue if the same CPU types or network chips or discrete components are used across the two channels. Also a potential issue is if the same hardware boards or hardware assemblies used for both channels, with coupling between the boards caused by overheating, causing thermal cutouts, electromagnetic compatibility issues, or shared power supplies or power supply components. To avoid common cause failures in an ACL B of D system, you either need to have components that directly support the ACL D requirement, or you need diversity between the two channels so that they will not have common cause failures in a number of different dimensions. While there are some easy techniques, such as buying different operating systems to run on each channel, decades worth of research have shown that simply identifying different sources for components does not guarantee perfect diversity and permits some common cause failures. Attending high diversity of 90% lack of common cause failures is pretty straightforward, but getting past that is a lot more difficult. Doing so requires significant, dedicated engineering effort to actively manage the potential risk of common cause failures and ensure that they're eliminated during the entire design cycle, as well as follow up after deployment for any newly discovered potential common cause failures. If this diversity is not actively managed and analyzed, it is inappropriate to claim ACLD safety requirement credit for an ACL B of D redundancy strategy. In addition to a move to significantly more redundancy inside control systems, the move to highly automated vehicles is causing significant changes in the business architecture of the suppliers and the car manufacturers. A big feature of this is a move to more centralized computing architectures. The older architectures in cars were an electronic control unit, an ECU, basically one or more CPUs inside a box, per major function. So there would be a separate ECU for stability control, and a different one for engine control, and a different one for transmission control, and so on. While there might be some combinations of functions, the idea behind the many, many ECUs in a vehicle was in part so that different suppliers could each own their own ECU box and not have to worry about detailed integration with other suppliers. That means a car was designed as a number of computing boxes with each computing box having its own hardware, software, and other integration to provide one or a set of functions. All those boxes are wired together and bolted into a car, and that's how you'd get a car. A very important aspect of this was that the OEMs would rely on the first tier suppliers to do the heavy lifting for system integration. And that was reasonable because each one controlled their own fate via dealing with all the things that happened in their ECU, plus collaborating with the OEM and other suppliers to make sure that the boxes would work together when they were put into a car. Over time, and especially with electric vehicles and highly automated vehicles, there's been a shift to a newer architecture with a central computing ECU. Rather than having a large number of inexpensive, moderate capability CPUs with each function having its own CPU, now there's a trend towards extremely capable CPUs 
in many cases with GPU support for high compute capability, all integrated into a single central computing box. That makes it a lot easier to do things such as combinations of sensor fusion and path planning and vehicle control and many other functions. Communication costs are reduced because all the data is already there in a local computer. However, this means that there's software and features from multiple different suppliers and the original equipment manufacturer, the, the car maker, and this means the OEM has a very significant software and feature integration problem that used to be handled by the first tier suppliers. The multifunction and multi-vendor software integration problem requires the OEM to sort out resource and functionality conflicts in a way that was not really necessary with multiple ECUs. This in turn significantly increases the responsibility of the OEM to perform system and safety integration tasks. The move to highly automated vehicles is creating significant changes in the computing architecture approach in vehicles. From an older approach of feature-specific ECUs with many different computing boxes put into a car, there's a move to significant centralization to a smaller number of highly capable computing platforms. An implication of this, however, is that the vehicle integrator needs to integrate different features and pieces of software from different suppliers and different in-house groups into a single computer, which requires a lot more coordination effort. There's also a change from a fail silent to a fail operational strategy. When the driver was able to take over after computing failure to manually control the vehicle, fail silent on individual features was arguably okay. But now the computer has to keep driving the vehicle even after something has failed, leading to requirement for significantly more redundancy. Redundancy alone won't solve the problem because if all the redundant channels fail at the same time, the redundancy didn't do you any good. Therefore, there's a need for diverse, different channels doing different strategies for controlling the vehicle, which is significantly more complicated and significantly more resource-intensive than for older vehicles.